Um, okay, so let's let's do one more. The title poem, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. And we've got another bird here. Uh, we do. And I'm glad I, I'm glad we're closing with this one. As, as you've noted, this um, is the poem that I chose to give the title to the uh, to the whole. Poem. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Um, I think in a way, the Kingfisher is almost the emblematic or iconic Hopkins bird. Because the kingfisher, um, it's a small, very brightly colored bird. It's very active. It's mobile. Um, it's a very English bird. He would have seen them hmm. walking the streams in the countryside. Um, and that combination of, of brilliant color um, and fast motion is so Hopkinian, if you can invent that word. That's a terrible word. So so Hopkins-like in, in that image. And I think this poem um, conveys... A, a lot of Hopkins to sort of essential essential qualities. It's almost the iconic Hopkins poem in, in my mind. Hmm. Um, okay. And and that's why the, the um, I don't know if you noticed, but the cover um, colors are Kingfisher covers colors. So there's the oh, nice. turquoise and then the inner russet. Those are Kingfisher colors. So the book nice. has been, uh, yes. So if, and if you open yes. it up, you can see the russet inside of the, no, oh, they open up the, I should do that. Oh, I see. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Russet and turquoise for the Kingfisher. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm going to actually show people the book because it's, it's quite nice. And it, uh, as you note in the introduction, has a lot of margin space for making your own notes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. we should have, I should have done this before. So yes, you can see here, this is what annotations look like. Um, a whole, whole page of them facing off to, to the poems. Right. So as kingfishers catch fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that, being indoors, each one dwells. Selves, goes itself. Myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces. Acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ's plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his to the father through the features of men's faces um i noticed the the um some of the accents in here like on i say more the just man justice is um uh it's it's not it's nothing out of the ordinary he's just making it clear because it's a an iambic pentameter line and uh and there's the first um uh, what do you call it? The first beat, not the first beat. Um, whatever. The first syllable mm -hmm. is 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 missing, and so it's just making it clear that that you're starting on the first strong uh, syllable there in the poem. So you know, somebody even without those accents, you could you could gather that if you're familiar with iambic pentameter. But it's it's useful that he puts those in, and then there's some others where maybe it's it's you wouldn't know unless he put the accent. But yeah, I think um, he's. And this is why I left these in for, for this one, because he's he's clearly in this poem just adding a little bit of extra clarity um, to make sure that we're getting the emphasis. Like in that the last line of the uh, the octave, crying what I do is me, um, because you crying could be two syllables, but he's sort of aligning that to one crying what I do is me. Yeah. And that's important right, right. for expressing a key meaning of this poem what i do is me the way that i act expresses who i am um yeah and we get that in the second the second half you know the just man he, he, he's verbing a noun here again the just man justices i love that what do you do if you're a just man you justice yeah um uh keeps grace so that this idea of identity that's what this poem is all about it is about what it means to have identity in Christ. And it begins not with human beings, but with all creation. And that's right. so beautiful because everything, everything is created by God and he glories in it. And as kingfishers catch fire, 
that line, that image of a, of a you know, a turquoise and golden and russet kingfisher kind of flashing fire as he goes through the sunlit air to dive down to catch a fish. As kingfishers catch fire and dragonflies draw flame, you know, these, these little darting flame-like dragonflies. Mm -hmm. So we get bird world, insect world, and then the musicality as picture now he's dropping a stone into a well as tumbled over rim and roundy wells stones ring you can almost hear the echo of the stone tumbling down through the well mm -hmm. uh, and then a bell and this is particularly interesting and i gloss this um in my my edition um so a, a I see, he says, a hung bell's bow swung. If you don't know about how bells are put in towers, this might be confusing. But as I mm -hmm. annotate it, a church bell is hung or placed in a frame and then swung to make it ring. And the part of the bell where the clapper strikes to make a noise is called the sound ring or the sound bow. So he's using some <clears throat> bell terminology here. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, when he talks about the bell fling out its name, there's a medieval Catholic tradition, um, I think it's often still done. Um, well, in Notre Dame, I remember they replaced the bells a few years ago, and they they there was a post online where they described the names of the different bells. Exactly. And the so the bells have names, on. and they're even said to have um, been called baptizing them. You know, the blessing of the uh, the the um, the blessing of the bells, um, which you know, with holy water and, and prayers, it's it's a kind of you know a kind of baptism for this for this sacramental object so the idea of the bell ringing out his name specifically has a really sacramental connotation for hopkins not just any old bell we had the idea of a, of a bell that has been blessed for the service of the worship of god mm -hmm. so each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name and yeah. that musicality hung swung tongue and then we've got, yeah. you know, name, same. We got all so much rhyme internally and externally in these lines. So musical. And he already used the word ring about the stones, so he doesn't need to use that again about the bells. Exactly. It's almost like it's still resonating in our imagination. The stone is ringing. Right. And so we already have that ringing in our ears as we get to the bell um, flinging out broad its name. And then he says what this all means. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out, this is one of his more difficult lines, deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. That means it it shows forth, it deals out, like you're dealing a pack of cards, it shows out yeah. what inside of itself, indoors, is in it, what is in it. Um, um, would this be a good place to mention this this inscape idea? Is that sort of connected to this? Um, it is. I mean, Hopkins, again, this is an area that this we could talk a lot about. Um, but Hopkins had an, a sense that everything had a kind of essence, what he called inscape. Um, it's sort of it's isness, um, you know, the, the bellness of a bell or the kingfisherness of a, of a kingfisher. And he felt that it was possible to express this in a poem we called inscape. Is, is is there any difference between inscape and the, sort of the, the, the classical um, notion of, you know, quiddity or wh whatever you might call it, the essence of the thing? Is there He's any other from... uh, connotation that 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 has or is he basically just using another word for the same thing? Um, I think I am not sufficiently versed in, in the theology of it to be able to give you a definitive answer. Um, Do you think inscape has a, more of a connection to the way that we experience things the way that we intuit the being of something maybe? yes i think because i think what he's doing is it's definitely it we know for a fact it's rooted in that theology the idea of quiddity that's where it gets it. right um but right. i think what's making it distinctive for hopkins and i speak not as a theologian but as a literary critic i think that he's sort of translating that into into his activity as as a poet you know okay. because scape does have a kind of a visual almost kind of connotation yeah to it. and he's trying to figure out how do i communicate that you know it's all very well to be right. philosophizing about what is the quiddity of something but how do i show that in a poem um and that really right. is what he takes as his his task how do i okay. convey the inscape of something um in, yeah. in a poem now he uses self as a verb selves as a verb now i, I don't I, I feel like there's another poem in which he does that as well i could be misremembering but 
Um, yeah, I actually gloss it. It's um, that nature is a Heraclitian fire and of the comfort of the resurrection. Yeah, okay, right. Um, he calls man, he calls the clearest selvid spark. Um, right. So this idea of, of a human being as selving, as being itself, um, is is part of Hopkins's thought. This is part of what it means to be fully human, is to be yourself, to be human. Um, and of course, for Hopkins, that does not mean just do whatever you feel like, because to fully be yourself would be fully to be one with Christ. So yeah, you are being what you are meant to be. That is what it means to be yourself truly. Um, right. What I do me, said- for that I came, for that is what I was made for. I was made to be who I am. When, when he says goes itself, um, that makes me think of a kind of like a, a childlike language or a colloquial language that when we talk about something going something in the sense of making a certain sound like uh, because we do say go and he 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 goes and you know when we're talking about something someone saying something yeah right? i think that, i don't know if that's what he's getting at there or if that so, was a, because i think okay. that is an american idiom okay um so I, I don't I don't think that is what he's getting out there. Um, but I think he's trying to convey this idea of motion. Um, it's okay. it's going and it's movement. It is it is itself. But I think you're right. There is a kind of a childlike simplicity there. It it goes. It it moves. It is itself. It speaks right. and spells. That kind of childhood language of the of the you know the the childhood reading. It speaks and spells. Right. Yeah. And also deals out that being. That's another interesting very kind of almost casual sounding way of thinking of like a card game or, yeah. <laughs> or something, you it's know, unexpected. Um, and that's, that's what yeah. the fresh thing about Hopkins Hill, you have these, you know, the, these very sort of solemn associations, the church bell, and then he gives you an image that evokes like, you know, some people playing cards, but it's yeah. fresh like, Oh, well, yeah, right. This is what is, this is an image that conveys what it means to be myself. Right. And then having given yeah. us these pictures of it, um, then he moves, I say more, and then, and then he says more, he elaborates on it, on the way that this connects to, to Christ. What do you think he's doing there when he, uh, you can always as a poet say more without saying you're saying more. So what is the, what is the, what's the value of I say more? He kind of this move that he makes there. Um, uh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, it is always entirely possible that it's mainly I mean, it <laughs> does draw it, I mean it does draw attention you know like, like listen to what I'm going to say in that kind of sense yeah I but, mean he uh, is making sure that he that we see the emphasis on the I so he is he is now speaking as the poet narrator um right so I think he, he may we he may well be just calling our attention to say listen up like in the beginning of Beowulf, white listen up I say more listen to me well this is Okay, so maybe he wasn't thinking about this at all, but he's just been talking about what these other things say, what they speak and spell, and what they're speaking and spelling is themselves. Now, what he's doing as a poet and as a human being is he is describing other things and saying what they are. So you could take it as, well, now as a man, I can say more than they can say. They can only say themselves, but I can actually give them names. I can say what other people do. That kind of thing. Maybe there's something of that. That's in beautiful. You know what, Thomas? That that is a new insight for me into this poem. Um, and this just goes to the show the value of of talking about poetry with people who are interested. Please do this, readers. Do this with this book. I think that's a really beautiful insight, and it ties nice. into to his poetic vocation. Because what is what is he right. particularly charged to do? Not just as a human being, Adam naming the creatures, but as him, Gerard Manley Hopkins, poet. He is charged to say more. That is what he is doing in this very poem. He is saying right. more, and he's helping us to see what it is that uh, that he's doing. Um, thank you. I am going to now use this when I talk oh, about this you. poem. So when he says "keeps grace," that keeps all his goings graces. Um, is that grace? Great, great, or or it's explaining what what it means to keep grace. Well, I think he's talking about what it means to be now living sacramentally, because now he's moved from the bigger picture of the natural world to saying, "What does the just man do?" Um, and mm-hmm. you know, the just man is the one who has the mind of Christ. Um, so he right. keeps grace. He keeps in 
grace. He, he's in communion with God. He is in a state of grace. And that condition keeps all his goings graces. So by being in grace, by keeping grace, therefore his actions are full of grace. Notice how he emphasizes that stress that he keeps grace. He's, he's staying in that state and that, that staying in that state of grace keeps or ensures all of his goings, all of his actions are graces. And so therefore, ev because he is keeping grace, he's extending grace then to all with whom he comes in contact. And we see that in the next sentence. He acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. So insofar as we are in grace, we are in Christ, and we are therefore acting as Christ in the world in 10,000 places. Yeah. Yes, interesting. Um, I, I wonder, is he... Uh... Is he, that's also the saying more that he is doing, I think, yeah. is when he's bringing Christ into it. Yeah. And I think what we can, to some extent, apply that even back to the natural uh, animals and other phenomena that he discusses in the first stanza, even though he's specifying through the features of men's faces as the most exalted way in which this happens in, yeah and he's aware which... of god's presence in in every creative thing he's very aware of, right. of that um but there's a special way of course in which each of us human yeah. beings is is united with christ um right and that's i think what he's he's getting at we have this lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his so now we're seeing yeah. that these other people they're they're not christ's physical body these are these are yeah. individuals but they are lovely to the father through the features of men's faces so insofar as all of these people are in christ of course men he's using here in the sense of human being he's not just talking about male human beings yeah all human beings are lovely to god because they're made in the image of christ um so yeah. all of them are lovely to the father so I think when he says, I say more with the accent on both I and more, we can look at it, uh, the more being most importantly, seeing Christ and he's seeing more in these things than these things are necessarily making obvious about themselves, but also that he also what I said before about he as the poet and he as the human being. Yeah, it's all these things uh, at the same so time. This, and of course, yeah. we see this then that he has moved us from beauty of the natural world that we reflect in it anybody can see um if they've got eyes open that the kingfisher is beautiful um yeah and he moves from that to a sort of inner vision um you know i mean he remember he worked in the slums of liverpool and birmingham so he mm -hmm. saw christ in the faces of the poor who would not have right. been outwardly beautiful um but he's saying that these two are lovely to the father um yeah and so he's moving us from the easily accessible beauty to the more hidden beauty um, through the through the course of the arc of this poem. Well, great. Um, well, this was great. And I mean, like you said, a discussion always brings out more things, more thoughts than I would have had. Not only do you get to benefit from the thoughts of the other person you're discussing with, but you also you seem things seem to happen, you know, that when I'm just sort of staring at the page by myself, don't don't necessarily have. And that's so. why I really hope that this volume makes accessible because it has the annotations. I hope it takes away some of the fear factor, um, so the people who you know are interested in doing a reading group, you know, something like that, could get together and you know they've got a guide to go through it, and so you can start to tackle the poems and discuss them, knowing that you have a scaffolding that's going to keep you on track as to the meaning of the words, and therefore you can more comfortably engage and discuss and and apply what you know what insights does this give into my spiritual life knowing that you're doing it within what hopkins intends and i think that right. will give people confidence to read these poems um to reflect on them to discuss them i mean they hopkins has been a joy in my life for you know for 30 years and i i would love everyone you know who loves poetry or even who is mildly interested in poetry to have something of that same beautiful experience